Hello, so it's midday now, so I'm um, just going to get the stream started. I'll just hold fire a minute just to see if there's any more stragglers coming through and if this is actually working. Okay, so it's midday by my watch, so I should get started. So, uh, hello and welcome to this issue of Earth Live Lessons that have been organised by Lizzie Daly. She's arranged for a whole host of uh, wildlife experts, conservationists, filmmakers to, to speak to, to people about their area of expertise. So go ahead and take a look at some of the other lessons that, that have already been on and will be going on over the next month or so as well as there's some great speakers. So my name's Kat Gordon. I'm Senior Conservation Officer at the Shark Trust. We're a charity. We're based down in Plymouth in Devon in the UK. Although we've got an office based in the UK, we do work internationally to safeguard sharks, skates and rays around the world. So with over 1,200 species of sharks, skates, rays, and also their cousins, the chimeras, all of those have very different life history strategies. They've got different ways of reproducing, um, and that makes some of them more vulnerable than others, in particular to fisheries and fishing pressure. So our work involves trying to ensure that species that can be fished sustainably have appropriate management, while other more vulnerable species have suitable protective measures in place. So we also work to try and get the public, such as you guys, um, to get you involved in shark conservation. So that's through citizen science projects, such as the Great Egg Case Hunt, that I'm going to be talking to you about today. So I've been at the Shark Trust for around 10 years now. I mainly work in the species protection side of things. So I lead on our angel shark work, which involves working with partners to develop action plans and conservation strategies um, for these incredibly vulnerable species. Um, I work on sawfish, which aren't native to the UK, but we've been working to try and document um, the sawfish rostra that are held in UK collections. So not to do with my talk today specifically, but um, if you do see any of these anywhere, then that's what we're talking about. Then I work on campaigns such as our No Limits campaign to stop uncontrolled shark fishing. So for that, we're trying to get um, management in place for species that are currently um, not being managed appropriately. Then I'm also project lead on the Great Egg Case Hunt. So I've been fortunate enough to dive with quite a lot of, of different species of sharks around the world. But I think my favourite encounter has to be right here in the UK and actually not far from where I am here in Plymouth now. So it's off the coast of Cornwall um, with blue sharks. They're an absolutely stunning species. They really are a brilliant bright, bright blue. Um, and they're really curious as well. So they'll swim quite close to you, um, especially if you've got a camera. Um, cameras give off electromagnetic um, kind of fields that stimulates uh, a shark's um, electroreception. They've got an extra sense than we have. So they can detect that and they become quite curious. So that was a really amazing encounter for me. So as it's Easter this weekend, I'm sure most of you are aware of that and uh, hopefully have lots of chocolate supplies ready. To celebrate, we thought we'd bring you an egg special and not the chocolate kind, although you can eat that whilst you're watching, of course, um, but those that are laid by sharks. So um, in terms of reproduction of sharks, some basics that um, are worthwhile covering before we delve in. Sharks actually have a few different ways that they can reproduce and this depends on what species they are. So sharks actually invest a lot of energy into their young. Generally, we say that they're slow growing, they are very late to mature, they are long lived species and they produce relatively few young in comparison to spawning bony fish like cod or like haddock. So all of these factors mean that they can be very vulnerable to fishing pressure. So many species such as our blue shark here, um, these guys produce live young. So just like mammals do, um, and this is known as viviparity. So the blue shark actually has quite large litters. They produce 
between four and 135 pups each time, usually around the 35 mark. Um, but yeah, they do actually produce quite a lot of, of young for, for a shark species. If you compare that to the likes of a shortfin mako, they only produce around four to 25 pups. And that's every three years or so after a very lengthy gestation period. So even um, within those kind of reproductive modes, there are kind of huge differences um, that would make kind of the shortfin mako is a lot more vulnerable than the blue shark as it produces fewer young and they kind of take longer to get there. So on to our next mode of reproduction. Some species produce eggs within a thin membrane and these are actually retained inside the female um, and then they're born as if they're live young. So it's kind of uh, and in the middle phase between egg laying and, and live bearing. So whale sharks reproduce this way. Um, and this is known as, these are known as viparous species or it's known as aplacental viviparity. Um, there was a female whale shark that was studied um, from, from Taiwan that was found to have 300 embryos inside her. So again, they are quite large litters, but these are very large long lived species. And again, even within that mode of reproduction, there are a lot of differences. So some species will release unfertilized eggs to feed the young. Um, others like the sand tiger shark will take this one step further and the first um, embryos to kind of to, to develop and to hatch will actually eat their siblings. So you don't wanna be the last one out um, if you're a sand tiger shark. Then around 40% um, of sharks um, will produce by laying eggs. So that includes our little cat sharks. Um, so these eggs are encased in a tough capsule that helps to protect the embryo as it will develop. And you probably know these better as mermaid's purses. And that's what we're gonna be talking mostly about today. So these are known as oviparous species. So we've got five shark families that reproduce this way, and there are 13 orders within those families. I won't go into details of exactly what they are, um, but for the five families, we've got some small benthic sharks. So benthic, they live kind of on the seabed. Um, and these are the horn sharks, the carpet and zebra sharks, and then our cat sharks. Then the, the next family that produce, um, produce their young as eggs um, are the chimeras. So they're closely related to, to sharks and to rays. Um, just a quick one-on-one, -on -one, if you weren't aware, then, then sharks, you're looking, they have the gill slits on the side of their body. Most species will have five. There are species that have six or will have seven. And then if you look at skates and rays, they'll have their gill slits underneath on the on, on their bellies so although kind of sharks you would kind of generally think of them in this kind of torpedo shape you have got flattened sharks like angel sharks which do still have the gills on the side of their head and they are technically sharks rather than rays so there are a few different ones that can cause confusion but looking at the gill slits is the quickest and easiest way to tell what you're looking at um, and then after the the chimeras um, which only have one gill slit, one opening, but they are still, they've got that uh, skeleton made of cartilage. Then we've got the, the skates and the rays. Um, so those terms can be a bit confusing. Um, again, don't want to add too much confusion, but essentially true skate produce egg cases. So these, and then true rays will produce live young. In the UK especially, we have a long history of misnaming species, so it can get a bit confusing. Um, so species such as the thornback ray, the blonde ray, the undulate ray, technically they are all skate, but they've been called ray in their common name for a long time. Um, so confusion can often, often creep in there as well. We tend to use the terms interchangeably um, for, that, for that reason. So hopefully lots of you will have found, found these on the beach before. Um, or at least remember seeing them. A lot of people kind of walk over them thinking they're seaweed or maybe bits of plastic. They remember seeing them as kids but didn't really know what they were. Um, if you have found some, hopefully you've also found your way to the Great Egg Case Hunt and you've recorded your finds with us. That'd be fantastic if you have. Um, so the Great Egg Case Hunt is the Shark Trust's longest running citizen science project. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit more about these strange shaped capsules and what you do when you when you find them. So by the end, you'll all be experts as well. Excuse the pun. So um, these egg laying or oviparous species, 
they produce egg cases in pairs, so one from each uterus. Um, if we look at the species found throughout the UK and also in Northwest Europe, these are the, the main species um, that you're likely to find the egg cases for. So we do have species beyond this, but they tend to be a bit kind of deeper water ones, um, a bit further offshore, egg cases aren't likely to wash up as much. So these are the, the key ones that you're going, going to find. And depending on where you are in the country, in the world, um, you'd be finding different species as well. So looking at cat sharks first, you can see we've got those, those three species there, which all produce egg cases. Generally the two that you're most likely to find are from, from the nurse hounds and then the small spotted cat sharks as well, which are the much smaller of the two species. You can see they're very similar shape but the, the small spotted cat shark being much smaller than the nurse hound. So these ones, as you can see, have these nice curly tendrils. And these are used by the female to attach the egg cases to, to seaweed. And that really helps um, to, to keep them in place and make sure they're not washed away by any currents. So the female will swim round and round and round a clump of seaweed and she'll basically tie it in knots. So it's kind of acting like string to, to tie the egg case and to hold it in place. Not all shark egg cases will have tendrils. In the UK, we've got the black mouth cat shark, which has tiny horns instead of tendrils. And those ones are, are laid in deeper water and they're laid in corals. So um, not all shark egg cases will have tendrils and some skate egg cases will have tendrils. So it's not always a key ID feature to be looking at. But here in the UK, it's a, a fairly solid one to, to go by. So then looking at our, our skates and our rays as well, this row that we've got here are kind of probably the ones that you're most likely to find at the beaches. So in particular, the spotted ray and the thornback ray are some of our kind of more commonly found species. You can tell what species um, has laid them by looking at the different features. So we've got different sizes. Um, we've got very small kind of um, not one here. We've got the starry skate, which is much smaller on the white background compared with the flapper skate, which is huge. So looking at size is a really good indicator, looking at the shape, looking at the features like tendrils, like those pointed horns on, on each corner, um, looking at the textures. Colour doesn't really um, tend to be a good indicator. It can vary between a species, um, like those small spotted cat sharks. You can see some of them are kind of quite um, yellow and kind of amber golden. Some are kind of almost green, how, much, how well that shows. And some are brown, some are black. Um, so colour doesn't tend to be as good, but if you look at features and sizes, then you should be able to, to figure out um, what you've got. Most species um, of skate in the UK have got these pointed horns on each corner. If you're really lucky, you'll find one of the other, the, the larger species or the, the smaller one, the starry skate there as well. So that one I showed a moment ago is the flapper skate. Um, the flapper skate's the, the largest skate species. It's a very impressive species. It gets to around three meters. Um, and each one of these will still only have one embryo in. Um, so most species will only have one embryo. There are a couple of exceptions, which I'll come on to later on. Um, but yeah, we'll have one embryo that will grow inside of this the same as you would for kind of any of the, the smaller species like this, this cuckoo ray. So in terms of, of these ones, obviously the cat sharks, I said we um, had the female tying them onto seaweed. For the skate, if you can see that life cycle there, um, these images at the bottom, the, the horns, the kind of the female will um, poke the horns into the sand um, and then it will attract kind of detritus and sand and odd bits of debris and that will kind of help weigh it down. You should be able to see quite clearly on that one how covered it is. And that also helps its camouflage as well to keep them nicely nicely hidden. They also have a mucous membrane over the egg case, um, which does the same thing and helps to attract all of that sand. And you can kind of sometimes find them with bits of kind of remnants on them kind of attached onto the sides there. So these capsules act like little life support machines um, for the developing embryo. They've got everything they need inside them. They've got um, a yolk sac that provides all of the nutrients. Um, they've got 
slits along the horns here. I know you won't be able to see on the on the, the video, but next time you find one, if you soak it in water and have a look up in the horns, you should be able to see a slip. And that allows the fresh oxygenated water to come in and kind of cycle around, get rid of the, the waste and um, bring in kind of the fresh water. Then, moving on to my bigger egg case. So we've got our, our developing embryo inside. As it grows, um, the, the wings, if it's a skate, will kind of tuck over itself and the tail will kind of point it into one of those horns and it will beat its tail backwards and forwards and that will help to bring in fresh seawater. Then when it's big enough to do so, there'll be a slit that'll open between the upper horns. So when they are soaked and wet, you can kind of squeeze them yeah, where well, you can see that and you can see the opening which um, the, the young will have emerged from. And then they're ready to, to pop out and there'll be a perfectly formed miniature version um, looking just like the, the adult kind of skates and rays and, and sharks. They'll be completely independent. They will have to kind of go and find their own food. They'll have to avoid being eaten by predators. They've got to do everything themselves. So um, touching on predators there, these, these capsules generally, the, they're this dark color because they can blend in with seaweed. So it means that it kind of increases their chances of being avoided by any predators that, that want to try and break, break into those. But there are um, some species that will do so. So gastropods, so small little sea snails, they can kind of drill holes into them and take out that nutritious and um, nutritional egg. Um, then we've got other species of shark, like angular rough sharks, will also eat elasmobranch egg cases. Um, so elasmobranch being shark skates and rays. And then even baboons have been seen at low tide um, going out and, and finding shark egg cases and tearing those open to eat them as well. So they're not completely immune from predators, but if you soak them, you'll see kind of just how, how tough they are. They do become kind of really leathery. Um, they're actually made of a, a keratin collagen compound, which is the same as our hair and our fingernails. Um, so it keeps them really, really safe whilst they're developing um, inside. So empty egg cases, um, after that young has kind of wiggled and, and hatched out of the egg case, these are quite often dislodged and they're then brought ashore by currents and kind of wave action. So that's when you can then find these empty egg cases on the beach um, and then you can record them to the Great Egg Case Hunt. So this project has been running since 2003. We've received over 260,000 egg case records in that time. And that's not just from the British Isles now, that's from around the world, from um, across Europe and the Mediterranean, the USA, Chile, Brazil, Ecuador, South Africa, Australia. We're getting more and more records from further afield and working with more and more partners in different countries. And they're not just all on land either. So we've received reports of egg cases seen developing in situ, others that have been spotted by divers and snorkelers. So those records are really important as they help us link those that are found on the beach with actual known egg laying sites. So form can be very different to those ones I've shown you. We've got some really interesting egg cases like those from the horn sharks, which are spirals, um, which kind of the female will pick up in her mouth and kind of wedge into, into rocks and crevices. We've got the, the chimera ones that are kind of spindle shapes. As I said before, most of them only have one embryo inside, but we've got species like the big skate, which will have um, around three to five embryos developing. So some of them will have um, multiple embryos as well. So all of this information, one egg case record might not be that significant in itself. It will tell you which species it is and you know, roughly where, where in the world it is. But all of these records that kind of combine together, um, that all becomes data and then it becomes really, really valuable to us. And we can tell a lot more about broad distribution of species. Um, we can look at different trends. We've compiled this data before and we've submitted it to marine planning processes, which is particularly important for endangered and threatened species. Um, so there's lots of, lots of things that we can do once we've grouped all of that information together. Um, We've had um, some species like the, the common skate. Um, this one was actually um, long confused and was thought to be one species until it was 
um, identified as being two different species, the flapper skate and the blue skate. So they were long confused under the same name. So we've now got the egg cases from two different species. Um, we've had species like a starry skate, which is one of our smallest species that we see in the UK. Um, we've had somewhere in Shetland where they've been washing up kind of three times the size that we'd expect them to see. And we still don't quite know why that is. Um, there's been small eyed rays that have uh, been found on the east coast of the UK where they're not normally found and range isn't really known for that species. So um, there's lots of questions. The more kind of the more records that we receive, the more questions that we actually tend to have as well. So I've quickly run out of time. Um, usually I'd be encouraging you to get out onto the beach to go and find egg cases to submit them to the Great Egg Case Hunt. Obviously, at the moment, you can't do that unless you happen to, to live on a beach and it's part of your daily exercise. But um, if you just keep that thought in your head, just remember what these are. Next time you're out and about on a beach, if you go and find them um, and then you can record them to the Great Egg Case Hunt, we'll always help out with ID. So don't worry if you're not 100 percent sure. Um, you can always copy us in on our Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, send it through our website, um, kind of do any of those and, and we'll help out with your ID. Um, we've also got our um, Easter Egg Case Hunt trail and um, we've got on our website that you can print off the characters, stick them around your house, um, and or if you haven't got a printer, you can draw them, um, and then you can still go on an egg case hunt this weekend as well, as well as your chocolate ones, of course. So I think that's me up for time. So I can go over to questions and have a look on the thread and see what we've got on there. Um, <laughs> first one, not an egg-laying species, but what's the likelihood of great whites in British waters? Um, Fairly slim, but not completely unlikely. Um, the closest white shark we've had to British waters has actually been um, the Bay of Biscay in France. Um, so 160-ish miles or so from, from Cornwall, um, that one was caught. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a great white shark that was tagged that was called Lydia, and she was the first white shark recorded to have crossed the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. She got that far and then turned north and went back, so that was still a 1,000 miles off. So, yeah, it's there's not been a documented one, but temperature's right. We've got food source uh, in terms of seals um, and things like that here, so never say never. Um, where on the beach is best to find washed-up egg cases? Okay, so as I said before, they're quite well camouflaged to look like seaweed. So go for the patches of seaweed. You'll find that um, there's the strand line. Um, you'll find a lower strand line and the upper kind of higher strand line, one where the, the low tide's been, one where the high tide's been. Um, so those are good places to start. Always have a poke around with a stick or a boot first so you don't get any nasty surprises in there. Um, and otherwise, they're very, very light when they're empty. So they often get blown to the back of the beach. So back of the beach amongst kind of sand dunes and grasses are always really good places to look as well. Um, for those as well, um, just because you found an egg case washed up, it doesn't necessarily indicate it's been freshly laid as they could have been lying kind of empty for some time before they were dislodged and washed up. Um, what are all the shark species that can be seen in the UK? Wow, for that one, I think I'm going to direct you to the Shark Trust website where there's a section on British sharks um, that you can take a look at. We've got a good poster on there as well. Um, we've actually got around 40 species of sharks and 30 skates and rays and five or so chimeras as well. Um, so we've got a lot of species, most of those um, smaller coastal species, quite a lot of them, you'd have to go further out to see them. So you're not going to encounter them on a, on a kind of day trip to the beach. Once laid, do the mothers leave the eggs completely or stay around? Nope, that's them done. They'll lay the egg cases, they'll lay two at a time, kind of over a couple of days, weeks, um, months, and then that's them completely done. No parental responsibilities at all. Um, okay, so can the condition of an egg case tell you about the health and condition of a shark, skate or ray? Um, not, well, kind of. <laughs> is, the, is the get out answer. Um, you might find one that's got a small hole in it, um, which would likely be from a gastropod, one of those sea snails that has kind of sucked out the, the content. Um, so in that case, you'd probably find that the egg case hasn't um, survived 
um, you'd be able to see if it's a, a kind of soaked one that it didn't have an opening. So it was likely that it had been, been eaten. Um, otherwise, you can tell, you know, some of the egg cases, they're quite um, kind of broken down and degraded and they've probably been tumbling around for quite some time. Um, whereas others, you'll see that they're fresher. So you can kind of tell which ones are recent and which ones um, have been kind of lying around for some time, but not so much in terms of um, the health of the actual kind of um, skate or, or shark inside. Okay, so what type of egg cases in Norfolk specifically? So Norfolk, you're looking at thornback rays, spotted rays, uh, small spotted cat sharks, mainly those three species. If you're really lucky, you might find a starry skate, that's a North Sea species. Um, but again, if you head to the, the Great Egg Case Hunt website, we've got all of our maps on there and you can look by species so you can see what's been found in your area. Um, what are egg cases made of? Keratin collagen. Um, and then Shark Man Dan, thank you. First person to tweet when I find an egg case. Good to hear it. <laughs> thank you. On that note, I've been going 25 minutes, so I'll have Lizzie shouting at me soon. So I'm going to wrap up here. Um, feel free to carry on tweeting us any shark questions you've got, and we can go through and answer those. Um, thank you again, Lizzie, for, for hosting me on this Earth Live lesson. There's a couple more coming up today, so take a look at the website um, and see what other um, talks uh, are coming up and, and definitely get involved with those. Um, but thank you very much for, for listening. And, yeah, shout if you've got any more questions. Bye.